not only the environment of Central Florida, um, but really has come together. Um, Chris Castro and uh, Clayton Ferreira have formed a group called Ideas for Us. And instead of just keeping those ideas right here in our backyard, they said right away, if we have a good idea, why don't we share that around the world? And what they've been able to do and the collection of people they've been able to put together is just amazing. And I'm so happy we have Chris Castro here today to talk about the future of agriculture. Chris. Extremely excited to be here. This is an amazing event that I've been watching vicariously through Jim's Facebook page over the course of this last week. I was in Denver just till yesterday uh, talking about a lot of these issues that you guys are hearing about today. Um, in addition to my role as Ideas for Us, I'm also the director of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability and Resilience here in the city of Orlando. And over the last going on five years, my role has been to figure out how we make Orlando one of the most environmentally friendly, socially inclusive, and economically vibrant cities in the country. Food systems is cornerstone to that. And as sustainability professionals, we are taught to look seven generations from today. Imagine being in a field and looking more than 150 years from now, and the policies and programs and the initiatives and the partnerships that we're developing are all with that mindset of being able to sustain the growing economy, sustain the growing population around the world, our needs that we have. I'm excited to talk about agriculture and farming because in addition to my role, I, I um, also am one of the co-creators for Fleet Farming, and we'll get into some of that here in a little bit. But I wanted to talk first and foremost about the need here, right? Currently, about 7.5 billion people inhabit this planet with us. And we have a certain number of resources to come with that. And scientists are telling us that we're continuing to explode in that population. Today, 50% of the global population lives in cities, in urban areas around the world. And it's projected that by 2050, we'll hit close to 70 to 75% of the global population moving towards cities. So we as cities, as city officials, have to figure out how are we going to sustain, how are we going to feed everybody who's coming to our city? Like just after Hurricane Irma and Maria, we had upwards of 350,000 people from the islands come to Central Florida to seek safe haven. Feeding them, housing them, giving their kids education, giving them jobs. These are things that we grapple with every single day. Orlando is one of the, is the fourth fastest growing MSA in the country. We have about 1,000 people per week moving to our region, and we're expected to almost hit 3 million people metro-wide over the course of the next five years. We're also, as you're all probably well aware, the tourism destination of the world. And giving you a little rough back of, cap uh, back of napkin calculation, for every one city of Orlando resident, we have upwards of... <laughs> <laughs> ah, 255 tourists. <laughs> uh, let's try to quickly move beyond this slide. <laughs> That's supposed to come up much quicker. But uh, long story short, we're not thinking about uh, just the people who are residents of Orlando. We're thinking about those who are coming to visit us as well, right? They get to come. They certainly aren't thinking about energy conservation or the things that Justin was talking about. You get into your hotel room, you're bumping that thing down as much as cold as possible. You're taking longer showers. On average, each resident produces, a, or each tourist, about a ton of waste. And then you get to go back home, and we have to deal with this and sustain our economy, right? Mm -hmm. So as we grow in population, we're going to need more food, upwards of 60% more food than we have today being grown. And the challenge is that the modern industrial agricultural complex, although has been one of the greatest inventions of, mon of, of humanity, period, that has gotten us to this incredible explosion of population, we're seeing that it's ex extremely inefficient. It's very costly on our land, on our water, on our energy sources. The energy water food nexus is real. And we're seeing about 40% of the food that's being grown is being thrown away, it's being wasted, whether it doesn't leave the farm because of how it looks or because we don't necessarily consume all of it and it goes right into the landfill, right? So 40%, think about the resources that grows that, that, that helps us feed our country. The other interesting problem is the food miles that travel with our food, upwards of 1,500 miles per person, per plate, 
You're talking over 4,000 miles. Each one of us has a demand per day. And the amount of energy to food ratio, Yale did a study and it showed that there's 10 times the amount of energy calories in one calorie of food that you consume. 10 to one fossil fuel to food calorie ratio. That has contributed to about a third of global climate change. The, the agricultural sector is, is a huge debacle that we have and we gotta figure out how to do that. At the same time, one in eight people in the US are now food insecure in our households and many of our communities, even here in Orlando, that's much higher. We have 40 million acres of lawns in, this uni in the United States, more than the actual agricultural lands that we, that we depend upon. And then there's about 3,000 of those productive agricultural lands that are being lost to development every single day. We're growing, our cities are growing. So I wanted to slide through a, a few of these innovative strategies that we've seen here in Orlando and a couple around the, the country. And first and foremost, the suburban lawn and the ability to activate that is one of the greatest opportunities that we have. Orlando passed an ordinance back in 2012 that allows for 60% of your front lawn, 100% of your side, and 100% of your back lawn to be an edible landscape. You can make it a permaculture garden. You can put an in-ground farm. You can do raised beds. You can do fruit trees. This is an example of an organization I mentioned earlier, Fleet Farming, which Ideas for Us created, that essentially is activating these lawns, creating these creative CSA programs. The homeowner gets as much as they can eat without even maintaining it. They don't touch five to 10% of it, even if they could. That 90% is then processed, washed, sold to restaurants and low-income farmers markets. Creates a social enterprise. These are examples of solutions that people are implementing because of these innovations. You probably have all seen the viral now this video about the farm bot, right? We're now seeing that tech is coming in and homeowners can have these self-sustained, fully automated farming gardens that are being completely maintained, planted, turned over by robots. We are moving in this direction where homeowners could have a little solar panel hookup with a composter right there and be able to produce some of your food locally. Many are looking at autonomous tractors for some of these large scale industrial agricultural systems. We're also seeing that businesses are starting to activate some of the wasted space that they see as well. This is an example of an aerial of East End Market here in Orlando. And they were the first business to approach the city and say, hey, I wanna turn this into a quarter acre urban farm. Let's make it a market garden. Now we're starting to see Market on South has a market garden. We're starting to see many, many others that are activating this space. Urban farms is another area. One of the things we've done with the city of Orlando is take wasted, vacant, city-owned land that's sitting there for the next 10 plus years with no development plan and turn that over to a nonprofit or an organization to help activate it and help meet our food demands. Right? Growing Orlando became this organization who approached us a few years ago and turned this on South Street right next to the Amway, uh, Amway Center turn this quarter acre lot into an in-ground farm. Aquaponics is also another very interesting thing. This is in Winter Garden, the Roper Building. Valencia College now has access to this and has taken it over to train the next generation of horticulturalists and agriculturalists. But essentially, aquaponics is this closed loop system of growing fish, aquaculture, and growing vegetables in hydroponics. Aquaponics, the fish excrements and, and, and waste essentially feeds the nutrients that are needed for the plants. The plants clean that water, enters back into the fish tank, and you have this recycling closed loop system to grow both protein from fish and vegetables for our consumption. Here in Marriott in Orlando, we have the first warehouse urban, fa uh, urban farm, warehouse vertical farm at Marriott Orlando, the high cube. And this is really exciting for us because we are seeing more and more applications for this type of growing and this type of agriculture. The cool thing is Marriott is such a huge corporation. If they can invest in something like this to minimize the amount of food they're taking from the industry for their catering, we can really start to see this thing scale. We also have many others um, that are now putting gardens, the Ritz-Carlton being one of them, that have market gardens for their culinary. This is another beautiful example of an indoor vertical farm. And then I love this example from Brooklyn the Brooklyn Grange. It's one acre on a rooftop in, in Manhattan, Brooklyn, overlooking Manhattan, 
and the amount of food that comes out of here is thousands and thousands of pounds per week. They activate the community under them to help grow this food, and it's a full-scale operation. Imagine looking up bird's eye view down on Orlando and seeing an activated rooftops of green, green roofs and urban farms and, and solar, hopefully a lot, a lot of solar. <laughs> And the other interesting thing I, I see us getting into, we have in Orlando urban chicken ordinance. You can have up to six hens. Believe it or not, no roosters. No roosters in our community. You can have now apiary, you can have beehives in your backyard. And people like John Reif, a good mentor of ours, who started East End, is now doing apiary on top of East End Market. I don't know if you knew this, but he actually has beehives on the rooftop of East End. And he's thinking, working with ideas for us on how we scale beehives to people's lawns just like we did with fleet farming. What if you were able to get free honey if you gave us a little part of your backyard to come in and put a hive and we maintain it, right? Really cool sharing economy ideas. Lastly, our demand for meat. One pound of meat, we can use upwards of three to 4,000 gallons of water for one pound of meat. And I know this is a sensitive topic because a lot of us still eat meat and we like it and it tastes good. But the point is, is it's not sustainable. It really isn't. And many, many more people are moving towards a plant-based diet. So in five to 10 years, if you go down to the next <laughs> four rivers, maybe you'll see the Impossible Burger there, fully meatless, fully grown, ourselves, fully sustainable. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for the opportunity.